Welcome to Lift Your Legacy. My name is Jacob Rupp, father, husband, and rabbi. And each week we bring you an inspiring person or message to help you unlock your inner potential and create change that will impact the future. Thank you for listening and let's get to it. So much for joining me today. I have on a very special guest for you. Her name is Hani Gluck Yetnikoff, uh, and she is a phenomenally inspiring entrepreneur. She has built very large companies, and she also manages to balance being a religious woman and a mom and a wife and very philanthropically involved and helps mentor other people. So like, how do you do all this stuff? And what's amazing is her background is seemingly very unconventional when you think about someone who is so multi-talented and, uh, and has accomplished so much. We're going to get into what that means and how the very premise of is there a the seeds of success and like what the seeds of success are. So I highly encourage you to take notes. This is important. If you are a man listening to this, get your mom, get your wife, get your get your daughter, get your sister listening to this because it, there's a lot of empowerment here and, and it's all together an amazing experience to be able to learn from and and share some ideas with Hani. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this podcast has been brought to you by me, Jacob Rupp and Jacob Rupp's Consulting, uh, technically Lift Your Legacy. Now, I have to be honest, I help clients often get out of their own way. And something that has really held me up was exactly the same thing, that I was in my own way for months people have been saying you know talk about your coaching talk about how you help people share it etc and i had a really hard time putting it out there why because it's not that i don't think i do a great job i've seen amazing results from my clients you know 10x uh, more than that businesses fixed relationships um, helped people lose a lot of weight. People go on the path of, of making goals and fulfilling their goals. All of these things. I know I do it. And I've been in the coaching space long enough to know that there's a lot of people that don't really deliver. And the ones that do really deliver are, are worth literally their, their weight in gold because so often we're held back by stuff. And it's just like, if only I could get over that, if only I could work through that. And I help people do that. But for me, my big hold up was sharing that I do this in a big way, in a public way, especially on the podcast, because it's awkward. I don't want people to think, oh, I'm just making the podcast to, to sell you stuff or to talk about stuff. So that, that's not what I'm doing. Um, my point is like this. My coaching business is expanding. I'm taking on a few more clients. If you are someone that is struggling in the area of self-esteem, goal setting, health, relationships, or your, or your business, really, um, reach out. I don't know if we're a good fit to work with each other. What I can guarantee you is that we'll get on the phone for half an hour. Uh, I'll hear the kind of challenges you're having. You'll get a good feel, if you don't know me yet, of the kind of work I do, kind of program I would recommend for you. And if it's a great fit, we'll move forward. And if not, not. But I wanted to appreciate very much from the bottom of my heart, the fact that you guys all listen. I appreciate the amazing guests that I have, and I'm really thrilled to have broken through in my own life to the point where I could actually devote a segment to really make a somewhat long-winded, but I think very important advertisement. So if you want to reach out to me, the email is rabbi, R-A-B-B-I, Rupp at gmail.com, and the website is liftyourlegacy.live, and at lift, your leg- lift underscore your underscore legacy on Instagram, I think it's pretty simple. You, you know where to find me because you found the podcast. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to have on Hani Gluck Yetnikov. I think I got that last one properly, um, who is an all-star entrepreneur, mother, wonderful host. Actually, she and her fantastic husband hosted my entire family for about 45 days recently, which was great in Arizona. And what really stood out and why I've pushed, not only do I think that Hani should be on my podcast, but should have a podcast of herself, of her own, is because she's managed to live such a life of evolution and is currently in the running, uh, building the most, uh, the best place to work in all of India. She's built multiple companies, sold multiple companies, repositioned, worked with everybody, all this big stuff. And hopefully it's okay that I can share this, did not officially graduate college. And what is it like to grow up in a you know, I guess you could call it an ultra-Orthodox, a Hasidic enclave in Brooklyn, 
and take this very seemingly unstissel path to, uh, to, to working in, the, in, in the, the world of business and inspiring other women. So that's a long introduction, probably the longest one I've ever done. But Hani, thank you so much for joining me. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Did you ever see yourself getting to where you are now based on how you were raised? Certainly not. Obviously. No. Why yeah. not? Well, you know, when I, was, when I was younger, I had this amazing dream of what I wanted to build. And I think I was an entrepreneur from when I was a little kid. I was always sketching designs, wanting to do just cool things. Um, my parents did tell me, specifically my mother, gave me a tremendous amount of confidence. And she says, you can do anything you put your mind to and you will be successful. So I did always believe that. And I did have a lot of entrepreneurs in my family, like all my uncles and my aunts would help out. And so... And I saw them be super successful. So I knew that entrepreneurship was a great path. And it was an obvious path because my parents were not saying go to college. I mean, in fact, college wasn't even talked about in my house. It was get married, have babies, and uh, that's it. Your husband will take care of you. And that was not my vision. And so I got married at a young age. And I really did want to start this company. I, I had this idea. I was working for a doctor when I was right out of high school, 17 years old. And I really did want to start this billing company. And I was married and I wanted to go to college and I didn't have the support that I needed. And so marriage ended and uh, took all the steps I needed to get this business started. But everyone but, told but, me- But I one mean, of the steps, but, but sorry to interrupt, but one of the steps was not going to college. The reason why I think this is so important is because more than ever before, I believe college is a massive business that people are making a ton of money off of, convincing other people that it's like the stepping stone to their success. But I think also what you're finding is the people like yourself, for example, who kind of had to figure it out for themselves and dealt with some, some early life challenges, let's call it, are actually far more suited for the marketplace of business than those who sit and, like I did, take oceanography and uh, Roman history. Okay, so I want to speak to that because, you know, I have four children of my own and I'm married to an attorney who's extremely educated and so, and in a few law degrees. And so I think about what I want for my own children. I do want them to go to college because I don't want them to have to struggle through the things that I have to struggle through. Like I read and have read all my life a crazy amount of books, but I I read what I needed to, to learn, right? So I was very focused in reading everything I knew about sales, everything I knew about operations, everything I knew about marketing. So if I was in a college situation, I went to get a degree in business management or business administration and finance, whatever that major is, I probably could have gotten the information, but probably not from people that have actually done it, right? So, and also it's not, it's not necessarily motivated by a need, which means, for example, you know, I, I guess you could say, you know, the, uh, one of the things that, you know, I, I love is, 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 is martial arts. And one of the things they're always saying is that, you know, the most committed people to go into martial arts might not be the fitness people, but it's the people that understand they have to learn how to protect themselves. So the, 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 that being said, if I was going to learn martial arts just because I want a cool workout, I'm not going to care as much about the outcome, about the effectiveness, about the uh, pr uh, practicality as if I knew I have to protect myself. And I think the same thing's true that going from a college classroom where a lot of it's theoretical, you don't really know what you're going to do to a, you're sitting in a boardroom or you're making a pitch and you're like, if I don't nail this, like it's not happening. I think that also probably for yourself and, and correct me if I'm wrong, really locked in the why behind all the work you were doing. Absolutely. And that's exactly it. I think people should go to college if they don't know what they want to do with their life. I knew at 19 that I want to be a business owner. So I think for me, and by the way, I did go to college at like 20 something, 22 maybe. Didn't tell my parents, didn't tell anybody about this. I think I was studying and I was at my parents' house over Sukkis and I started in August and it wasn't until October that they actually found out that I was in school and they went a little crazy, like, what are you doing? Um, you know, and so at that point I had to like deal with that, but then my business took off and then I just, you know, went Let, Let's go back to 19 year old Hani or 17 year old honey or 11 year old honey. One of the interesting things that I think that I heard you say was go to college if you don't know what to do. Now, the, 
what to do, I think, is in and of itself a big question because you might have known that you wanted to build a business, but you probably had no idea how to actually do that. So I guess why do we expect, or, or if we can look back and maybe you could say this as a mother or someone that's been involved with, with mentoring a lot of, of women entrepreneurs, don't we know what we want kind of early? And then the process of what college is supposed to do is supposed to teach us how to do it. Like, do, have you found successful people that literally had no idea that they wanted to have a big impact in the world? They thought that, you know what I'm saying? Like, does that, is that true? Or, or do most people who you speak to that accomplish great things have a desire for greatness, might not know the how to get there, but definitely see themselves as kind of big players? Interesting question. I have met so many different entrepreneurs through my entrepreneurs organization that I belong to. And so there is such a range of people. There are people that knew from a young age they wanted to be entrepreneurs. There are people that are in their 40s and 50s and have been working for a company for years and always wanted to get out and never had the courage to do it and then finally just like did it. There's some people that will do a little something on the side and call it a business, but it's really a hobby, right? So if there's so many different kinds of people that say they want to start a business, but the people that actually execute and are successful and do it are the ones that they're making a real impact, but it takes courage and it takes a little bit of chutzpah, a little bit of guts, a little bit of fearlessness to be able to do it. Cause they speak to so many people and people can, so I had a friend who told me, you know, I have like 25 ideas written down or I could have been Sarah Blakely cause I had that Spanx idea. Like, why didn't you do it? Like, you know, so it's not so much about sitting with ideas and stewing with it. It's like, just go execute, just do it, do something. So that, that's very scary because, and I think that that's one of those, those themes that is not just applicable to business and to our careers, but really to life in general, is that a lot of us have a vision of what we want to live our lives like. We sort of know what we want to look like, but what trips us up even more than not knowing the practical steps, it's that sense of fear, that sense of breaking out of conventional, societal, our own expectations, what our parents might have expected of us. So as someone that's had to do that a lot, how do you, what's that process like for yourself? Are you even conscious of it when you feel like your world kind of closing in on you and you're like, okay, I'm going to have to push through this? Okay. So a few things. I definitely recommend coaching. Okay. Um, I think plug. Great. Yeah, no, Thank but you. it's true. A good coach um, could help you work through stuff. A good therapist could work through some of your like issues. Um, you, I mean, there's, there's books that you can read. There are mentors that you could look up to. Like when you're, when you're raised in a certain very bubble sheltered environment as I did, and you're kind of like breaking out and you're, and I never really fit into that box. And in that society, in that bar park, Brooklyn community where you have to fit into a box, you really have to figure out everybody for themselves how to get out. I mean, I've some, seen some people get out and be completely not from and just do like go completely the other way. I didn't want to do that. Like I still really loved what, you know, a lot of the way I was raised. Um, but I just made my own tweaks. And over the years, I mean, I'm in my 40s now. So it took me a long time to get to a place where I feel very settled, very comfortable, very comfortable with where I'm at, in my mind, in my spirituality, as a parent, as a wife. Um, it's, it's a journey, right? It's not like there's one thing that I could say did it. It's a combination of so many different things um, that I've done to kind of get myself to this place of feeling good about this. So, so that's interesting. So I guess what I'm hearing from you to say is that is, is there – is there kind of an ongoing struggle that you experience in your life? Or once you sort of made the shift to, I can create the life that I want, ever since then, it's just been a more question of how, not like I have to push through anymore because you just kind of push through. Interesting. Well, I had challenges. Obviously, I had challenges along the way. And so... Um, some challenges I could speak about, um, you know, my office is in my parents' house. And one day my parents were like, you're done. Like, you need to leave. You cannot be in our, in our, in our, in our downstairs, like, thing anymore. And I remember completely flipping out. And I have 
an amazing cousin of mine who's super successful in the nursing home business. And he said to me, I was devastated. I mean, I thought my life was over. I had all these clients, I had all my computers. I mean, I had like a business and I was getting kicked out and I'd never paid rent before. And just, you know, so my cousin, the kindness in his heart, he's just amazing. He called one of his friends and said, you could stay, you could use his office for as long as you need to until I had the courage to actually rent a place of my own, pay like all the overhead of having an office. And it was the best thing that happened to me. But in the moment, I was like completely shaken. Um, and so I had to work through that and being upset with my parents about that whole situation. But we moved on and it, it's fine. Um, so that, that, can I just like go into that experience of, of feeling shaken? Like what what is that? Is it like you, you start to, you're like at a level now where you're like, I think I can do this or again, what is this? I guess, yeah, certainly renting an office space is admitting to yourself, I guess you could say that you have something much bigger than just a fun startup project out of a garage. Okay. So maybe I should backtrack a little bit. Okay. So I'm 21 and I'm divorced and I'm alone. And my, I assumed I would move back to my parents' house. And my dad's like, well, you're making this much money. I think you could afford your own place. So I'm like, okay. So I had my own apartment and I was paying for that. And so that was like step number one at 21. I was already like learning to be self-sufficient. Then came the business was the second part. And that was like probably 23, 24, where I had to rent this office space. Um, and so that was like the next level. So I had to get over like, I guess, little fears, right? Because of course at 21, I'm terrified. Like, how am I going to pay my rent, right? It was like $650 and like all that, maybe it was like 800, like my whole overhead was maybe $1,000, right? And I was probably making, I don't know what I was making, maybe 40,000 a year at the point, right? So just going through each point and I'm like, oh, I can rent my own apartment. I could do this. Like I can buy my own groceries and make my own, like I can do this. And then, you know, just, just going through that process. And then, so having my own office was the next step. And then, you know, learning how to delegate um, and not doing everything myself was like the next step. And as you continue to evolve as a business owner, you, you learn new competencies and you train yourself on how to do different things and how to get over those fears. And you're like, if I could do this, I could do that. And if I could do that, then I could, you know, and then it just keeps growing and growing from there. So that, that in of itself is a phenomenal idea because the process of overwhelm when you are, this is something I, I speak a lot about and, and I, what you're saying kind of reminds me of that idea is that we get overwhelmed because we're too many steps ahead in the process in our own mind. And the ability to say, if I'm overwhelmed, that means I'm just not looking at the next step because the next step's not necessarily going to overwhelm me um, is, is a mindset shift that, that makes you much more, I guess you could say, practical about, okay, how do I actually take my next step? So it's like, you know, you looked at your finances, you looked at the cost of the, of the building and you're like, I could probably make this work. And then you did. And then after that, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's a phenomenal idea. One thing that is like, really kind of like sticking out and I'm, I'm having trouble overcoming it is that you started with the premise that you don't necessarily want your children to have to suffer like you suffered. But it sounds to me like the places that you suffered were the areas of greatest growth. So I'm curious, mostly from a, forget about the parenting thing for the moment, but like as someone that mentors younger women, um, how do you how do you balance that? Do you, do you encourage them to go out and, you know, get their face messed up a little bit? Or do you try to create for the people that are kind of under your influence the smoothest way to get into where they want? I think the smoothest way, because look, there is, there's, there's growth and pain, right? When there's pain, there's growth. And so, yes, a little bit of pain is good. But if you could, if you could avoid the pain or actually anticipate what's going to happen, you're in a much better position right? Or having that dialogue in your head to be able to deal with the pain is also effective, right? Because you see people going through certain transitions in their business, and they're almost like debilitated. They cannot move forward. I've seen some people be stuck for years in a certain place. Um, I had one girl that I'm mentoring reach out to me, and, and she's obsessed with all, like she has a competitor that's posting things that she does, right? And she just can't get past this. She's like copying me. She's doing things. And I'm like, girl, listen, 
who cares what she's doing? You're operating from a place of scarcity. There is abundance in this world. Like just reframe your head, stop looking at her, unfollow her on Instagram and just do you, right? Like just, just do what you have to do. So I think there's so much different head trash that people have that really holds them back. And someone could be spinning in certain things for years and certain people can get out of it quickly. And I think the blessing for me was that I was lucky enough to have some really great mentors along the way that have helped me get out of certain head trash places. If that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. I would love for you to talk a little bit about how the entrepreneurial journey and all of the work you've done on yourself and all the people that you've been exposed to does it correlate to your Jewish journey? How does, a, a, I guess you could say, a, a passionate, committed relationship to, to God and to Torah, how does that impact or play into your business life? Great question. Wow. Okay. So I love being Jewish. I am the first grandchild of Holocaust survivors. So my grandparents were both, from my dad's side, both Holocaust survivors both had their entire families wiped out. And so they were the only surviving members of like their parents, their siblings. Their... My grandfather had a whole family before he had my dad. Um, and they are like truly my heroes. Um, my grandfather lost so much. Think about losing a wife and three children and then got married to my grandmother who didn't have a family before, but she also lost her family. And for him, both of them, to be such happy people, like you would think you'd go into like a major depression after like a crazy incident like that. And he was the most vibrant, happy person. And I named my son Moshe Yosef after him just because I think about him every day. And so I think about any challenge that I have, I always think about my grandfather who what am I stressing about? Like stupid things that happened. Like he freaking lost his whole family and he was so happy. And he was like, so, so that is a major source of inspiration. And he was extremely Jewish and very pious and very learned and, and all of that. Um, and so I feel like I have a responsibility to my grandparents who have endured so much torture and, and abuse and, and all of this for being Jewish, that I must be Jewish and I must show my love of Judaism and be proud to be Jewish. And my children should be proud to be Jewish. And we don't want like Hitler to have one, right? So that's my reason for wanting to have four children and wanting to, you know, just spread that. In addition to that, I think there's so much beauty in Judaism. I love Shabbos. I love the fact that technology is off. It's a great break. It's a great time to think. Like we talk about, you know, I hear all these things about focus days and, and buffer days and people have to schedule all this stuff. I have a focus day every Shabbos, right? To just really process about, oh my gosh, how great was this week? What happened? What do I want? Like just in my head. Um, so I love Shabbos. Um, Kosher also. I think there are rules in kosher that, you know, are important. Um, it's challenging being a business owner and being with a lot of non-Jews and being a lot of civilization. So I definitely am challenged by it. But I did have an awareness recently, and I want to share this because I think maybe some people would appreciate this. So my husband was raised modern Orthodox, and my in-laws had put him in all these different non-Jewish situations from a very young age, non-Jewish sports camp, non-Jewish this, non-Jewish that, where my parents kept me very insulated and in a little bubble. And I didn't even know any non-Jews growing up at all, like literally no one, maybe my cleaning lady, but that's it. And, um, and I was wondering, I was at a conference and I'm drinking my coffee or whatever it was. And I'm wondering, why am I feeling so uncomfortable? Like everybody's eating treif and I'm sitting here and I just feel so uncomfortable. Like this feels so weird. And I realized that my parents had always taught me in Rome, you do like the Romans. And whenever you're here, like when you're in Bar Park, this is how you act. And when you're on vacation, we could be a little bit more chill, right? But you always conform. Conformity is, is what we do, right? And so, my husband has no problem going to meetings and drinking his coffee or his water. He's totally comfortable. And I realized that my in-laws taught him how to just be so strongly identify with what you're doing that you feel really comfortable with it. And I thought, you know what? 
this conformity thing that I was taught was not the best thing, right? Because I feel like I need to conform and, and eat with everybody, which is not really the appropriate thing to do. So in that regard, this is a long answer to your question, but the Judaism part is still very you know, important to me. I want to raise my kids Jewish. I want, I think the, the blessings that we say um, every day, we talk, you know, everyone talks about gratitude, right? And the importance of being grateful. And we have grateful built into our day every day in Judaism. Um, so there's so many beautiful things. I mean, I can go on forever about all the beautiful things of Judaism, the holidays, the structure, the excitement, the anticipation of like, Shulis is coming and we're gonna decorate our house with flowers and, you know, all this stuff. I think it's exciting and it's a great way to live, to continue to look forward to things, right? To just give yourself like different things that you can look forward to. So that's, that's, that's phenomenal. I really appreciate that. I, I, you know, it's interesting. I was listening to a podcast with the founder of soul cycle. One of, I guess it was a co-founder. And so she was saying, uh, uh, Tim Ferriss was asking her, you know, what, what's your, you know, mindful practice, whatever it was. And she, she drops on Shabbat and she's like, I was speaking to someone who's much more successful than me. And she says, she just turned, she was explaining like their, their ritual, you know, Tim Ferriss with the, however, however, however many, millions and millions of downloads. She's talking about the holiday. She's talking about the grape juice. And one of the, the beautiful things that I heard from you is that rather than trying to adopt various practices that we feel like are good for our life, the benefit sometimes of accepting a, a whole workable system is that it allows you to mature into it and learn all of these different lessons. Whereas if you just say like, I like the idea of relaxing on, you know, Friday night or whatever it might be, uh, that it's, that it's, 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 it's more challenging. So that, that's phenomenal. What would you say the role of, and I know this is a very broad question, what would you say the role of a Jewish woman should be? Okay. Um, first of all, a role model, right? Your kids are watching you all the time and they learn from you and they model you. So being that role model that you want, kindness, charitable, all that, well, everything that you want your children to be, you need to be, right? And that that's for anyone, Jewish, not Jewish. Um, I do have help. And so I realize I'm a big delegator. And so I realize there's certain things that I don't necessarily need to do in order to be a good Jewish mother. I have to make sure that Shabbos is on the table and we have it. I just don't need to necessarily be sweating in the kitchen and doing it, right? I can delegate and have my housekeeper help me or somebody help me with that. So <clears throat> I think it's a woman's job to create the aura and the environment of the of Judaism and make sure that they do their brachas and their nekovasar and like all those ritual things. Um, but I also think it's important for a woman to be calm and be patient and so even if it's an hour before Shabbos and guests are coming and things are stressful, I think there should be an aura of calmness because if you're going to do it and it's going to be annoying, if your kids are going to think that it's annoying or stressful, then they're not going to want to do it, right? So it's got to be in the spirit of relaxing and calm and peaceful and it should be beautiful. And at the Shabbos table, there should be happiness and not fighting or you know do you know what i'm saying it's it's the it's it's the environment and the aura and the home because that's what's going to make them want to do it and to me it's all about like i know my judaism and my relationship with with hashem but it's about now i have to give it over to my children right and and how am i giving it to them um so i think that's important but also working on my own spirituality but i will say this i've gotten a lot of my spirituality from non-jewish sources and like life-changing book was like Gary Zukav's Seed of the Soul or books like that, which are not necessarily Jewish, but um, in a time where I was not feeling so spiritually connected, it helped me to get it from other sources or like books like The Secret and all that. Those are all really Jewish principles. So it doesn't really matter if I listen to Oprah Soul series or whatever it is and I get spirituality from there, it, a lot of it's Jewish related. That's outstanding. Okay, honey, I feel like we need a part two or three or four. Um, tell tell people how they can find a little bit more about you, social pr footprint you might have, et cetera. Okay, so I'm really not a big Instagram poster because I'm like just a private person. But, We're working on um, that. Um, 
You, my website is 4dglobalinc.com. So we do outsourcing for medical in the medical industry. You can find me on Facebook at Khani Gluck Yetnikov. Um, follow me. Uh, what's my C Y E T one Oh one is my uh, Instagram handle. Fantastic. Khani, thank you so much for the time. There you have it, folks, another inspiring episode. If you enjoyed this, I ask you to please share this with your friends and to like us over on Rabbi Rupp through Facebook or on YouTube. And the more that we're able to get these important messages out, the more that we can really make an impact in the world. So I encourage you, please, to stay tuned. Uh, We have a ton of amazing speakers coming up and also to tell your friends about it. Thank you very much.